Okay, here we go. Chapter 18. It was my fault, Mel said, sobbing into Aunt Cassie's arms. They were up in her little room. Steve was cleaning and bandaging the wounds on her leg. The cut wasn't too deep at all. The claw hadn't hit muscle or bone. Mel would have a scar, but nothing like Steve's. She didn't feel any pain. She was just confused and angry, mostly at herself. It wasn't her fault. That's what most people at the chalet thought. What was the girl doing out there, Greg asked. Stupid girl. Mel thought Steve, gentle, quiet Steve, was going to punch the guy in the face. Don't you dare call her that, he hissed. This whole place, what you're doing here, it's wrong. It's a miracle she wasn't killed. That shut Greg up, but the worst was what Mel heard as Cassie was taking her upstairs. They passed the three men Mel had seen on the porch. It was unbelievable, the mustache man said. A girl and a grizzly and that porcupine scared it away. You can't make this stuff up. The men had laughed, had laughed as if Mel had put a show just on, for them, on just for them. The memory of it made Mel sob harder. Cassie held her tight, rubbing her back. Finally, Cassie pulled away and gripped Mel by the shoulders. All right, she said, that's enough. Her voice sounded stern. No more of this. It's not your fault. The people who work here have been feeding grizzly bears. How could this be your fault? But if I hadn't run off, Mel started. But Aunt Cassie cut her off. No, she said, wiping Mel's tears with a bandana. And another thing, Cassie said, she gripped Mel's chin gently but firmly and looked her in the eyes. The car accident, that's not your fault either. Mel stopped crying. She stared at Cassie in surprise. Yes, Cassie said as her voice softened. I know that's what you think. I know that's why you won't talk about any of it. Why you're not able to let go of that night. Mel sat back. How did you know? Because I know you, Aunt Cassie said, gripping Mel's shoulders. And maybe I would have felt the same way if I was 11. But my mother, my incredible mother, was killed before my eyes. I would have wanted to make sense of it. I would want to know why, why. And maybe I would think it would be better to blame myself than to think there was no reason, that it was just an accident. Cassie gave Mel a squeeze. But it's not right. You must stop thinking this way. You know what your mother would say to you if she knew you were blaming yourself? You know how mad she'd be? Mel pictured mom, her fiery temper, and her own surprise. She let out a little laugh. Now that was a funny, but it felt good to laugh. Like taking a big breath when you've been underwater for too long. A few minutes later, Steve knocked on the door, then popped his head inside. Everything okay, he asked. Cassie looked at Mel. Mel nodded. Cassie turned to Steve. It will be. They left the next morning and were back at the cabin by 3 p.m. Mel asked Cassie and Steve not to tell Pops what happened with the grizzly. Cassie didn't approve, but Mel convinced them that it would be too much for Pops, at least right now. She promised she'd tell him and Dad when they got home the whole story. But they did share with Pops all they discovered at the Granite Park Chalet. They turned their cabin into an office for Cassie. For three days, the sound of Pops' old typewriter filled the cabin. The editor of National Geographic was waiting for the article. On Saturday, they drove down into town and mailed it. They stood in front of the mailbox and Cassie handed the big fat envelope to Mel. You did it, she said with a smile. This was all your idea. Let's do it together, Mel said. They each held up one side of the envelope and pushed it through the slot. They stood there for a moment and Mel felt a rush of hope. But that hope, did, hope didn't die. Hope died the next day when Steve came rushing to the cabin. And what he told them was more shocking than anything Mel could imagine and far more terrifying. When, first, when Steve first came inside, he could barely breathe. He collapsed into a chair and sat there in shock. Mel Pops and Aunt Cassie gathered around him. Luckily, Kevin was playing hard all morning, was taking a nap. Mel studied Steve's face. It was a jumble of anger and sadness. He took a deep breath. There was a grizzly attack Matt, last night at Granite Park at the campground below the chalet just after midnight. He spoke so quietly he had to lean close. A 19-year-old girl was killed. The grizzly dragged her from a sleeping bag. She had a friend with her, a young man. The bear bit him, but he survived. Mel's whole body started to shake. One hour later, Steve continued, there was another attack. A second girl died. He swallowed, and it wasn't at Granite Park. Where was it, Mel asked. Trout Lake. Pops frowned. But that's at least 10 miles from Granite Park. There must be a mistake. No grizzly can move that fast. 
Steve closed his eyes and took a deep breath. It was a different grizzly. But son, that can't be right, Pop said. It's just impossible. Two girls killed in one night by two different grizzlies? I know, st sir, Steve said, but it happened. It happened. I heard from the rangers today. They're hunting for the grizzlies right now. Mel clapped her hands together. She felt sick. Pop stood up slowly. All right, he said. I've made a decision. We are leaving here as soon as we can. It's not stay safe to stay. His voice cracked a little, like when he told Mel Mom had was gone after the crash. By Tuesday morning, they were all packed up, cleaning the cabin, and loaded the car. Steve came to say goodbye to all of them. He was staying. The rangers had asked for his help. They, they understand that this place needs some big changes, he said. They're already starting to clean up some of the campgrounds, and they're going to do much more. So at least that's a start. But look what it took, those poor girls, Pop said. Both girls were 19 and in college. They worked at Glacier, just like Mom and Cassie had when they were in college. And the bears, Cassie asked, have they been found? The Granite Park bear was a mother with two cubs, Steve said Natalie, nodding. They shot that bear. Her claw was completely torn up, probably by glass, and she was in pain. And the other one, Pop said, the Trout Lake bear. Steve looked down for a moment and Mel knew what he was going to say. It was the same bear that came here, I'm sure. Skinny, sickly. They shot it too. That bear was also suffering. Its teeth were full of glass. Old Slim. Of course, that bear wasn't a monster. He was just a sick animal in pain. Steve hugged them all goodbye. He said he'd visit them at home in a few weeks. And an hour later, they were pulling away from the cabin with Kathy's Volkswagen following behind. She was coming to stay with them for a week in Wisconsin. Mel turned and watched Lake McDonald slowly disappear until it was just a thin line of turquoise in the distance. She rolled down her window and breathed in the sweet smell of pine. Some birds sang out as though they were saying goodbye. Mel whispered goodbye back, just in case, just in case they never came back to Glacier again. One year later. Here you are, Dad said as he turned down the dirt road that led to the cabin. Here we are. The car was barely stopped when Kevin flung open the door and rushed down to the beach. Wait for me, Pops called, limping after him. Mel stepped out of the car and took a deep breath. Dad came around and put his arms across her shoulders. Good to be here, isn't it? And it was. It looked the same as it always did. There was their snug cabin with the big front porch. There were the pine trees and there was Lake McDonald, the bright blue water shimmering in the late afternoon sun. Everything looked the same. But things had changed at Glacier. They'd been hearing all about it from Steve and they'd read Cassie's new news article in National Geographic. How one tragic night in August could transform the park forever. The deaths of those two girls were trans had transformed Glacier and other national parks in America. Campgrounds grounds had been cleaned up. Granite Park Chalet had a huge new incinerator for trash. The manager, Greg, was gone. There were more rangers to patrol the trails and to follow up on reports of problem bears. Park visitors received a long list of rules, camping and hiking, to never leave trash or food behind in the campgrounds, to never feed the wildlife. To show respect, some hikers were following the rules, some weren't. Mel knew it would probably take years for some people to understand what it really meant to show respect for the wilderness, but at least now she felt some hope. After a sim sim simple dinner of hot dogs and beans, all four of them headed down to the beach. While Pops and Kevin built a campfire, Mel and Dad walked to the water's edge. They should, stood shoulder to shoulder and looked out over the lake. Your mom loved it here so much, he said. I know, Mel said. Remember how she used to dare us to jump in the lake? And how she made us climb to the top of the fire tower, Dad said. And the time she caught four trout in one afternoon and then bragged about it all summer, they all laughed. They talked about Mom all the time now. And when Mel felt the heart-cracking sadness coming over her, she didn't sit alone in her room. She found Dad or Pops or someone else and talked about Mom. Mel, Kevin said, Daddy, we're roasting marshmallows. Okay, Kev, Mel shouted out. He's even bossier than Mom, if that's possible, said Dad. With the fire roaring, Pop started up the stories. Kevin snuggled on his lap, clutching a new favorite toy. Only Aunt Cassie would know where to find the stuffed porcupine. Mel looked around at her family. Her eyes started to water. She missed Mom so much, and she knew how happy Mom would be that they were all here. 
Mel couldn't stop the, di didn't try to stop her tears. Steve had been right. It's no good trying to hold things in. Running from sadness was like running from a grizzly bear. It would chase you and it would catch you. Mel was done running away.